Hello. Today we're visiting the north of England to see a very unusual tank, the AMX-13. And because the AMX was such a radical tank for its time, this will be just the first of two videos featuring it. This particular vehicle here is not a museum piece, but one that has been restored by the man standing next to me, Warwick Bolton. Warwick, why the AMX? Well, I was just looking for a tank to restore at the time, and this one became available. I didn't know much about it, but uh, fitted the bill. About the right size, a bit different. And what can you tell us about this particular vehicle's history? Very little, actually. Uh, I know it served in the Dominican Republic, and then was returned to France and built, bought by uh, a Belgian dealer. That's where I, where I bought it from. How big a restoration job was it? Immense. Um, it was a total non-runner. There was parts missing, although it looked fairly complete. When you actually got into it, there was parts missing from the engine, the transmission. Inside was a nightmare. And, and what would you say was the hardest part of the whole restoration project for you? Changing the engine. Uh, that was almost a nightmare of a job. I mean, the, that's there is the engine hatch it comes out of. But to get the engine out, you have to strip the engine down in situ, pull it out, and it comes out vertically. Then the new engine, I managed to find a brand new engine in, up in Holland. Um, again, brand new engine in a box, complete. You then have to strip it down, get it through the hatch, get it in situ, bolt it back up and rebuild it. Uh, took about three days in, three days out. The AMX was designed shortly after World War II in 1946, but when compared to what was in service, it contained some quite radical thinking. Let's try to understand why. Like all armies after the war, the French initially made do with the mass of available vehicles left over. They even had a brigade equipped with German Panthers right up to 1950. At the time, France was also involved in what had become a long and bitter colonial war in Indochina, with similar troubles brewing elsewhere, notably Algeria. Faced with this, and also the start of the Cold War, the military had a difficult mix of challenges to face. One key requirement was for a light tank that could also double as a tank destroyer. It was to be fast and manoeuvrable, but with a decent punch. But more than that, it had to be light enough to be air portable. Now, getting a big gun into a small chassis has always been the biggest challenge for tank designers. The usual solution in World War II had been to sacrifice a fully rotating turret in favour of a gun with limited traverse, like the Hetzer, Stug and all the other German tank destroyers. But freed from the problems of an actual armoured war, the designers could explore more innovative solutions, and this is immediately apparent in the AMX's turret. The AMX has what is called an oscillating turret, which means that to raise or lower the gun, the whole turret moves up and down, rather than the gun moving within the turret. This has been tried before, in aircraft gun turrets, and also in the experimental German flak tank of late World War II, the Kugelblitz. There are in fact two parts to the turret, a lower housing that rotates through 360 degrees, and an upper assembly that moves up and down. Fixing the gun like this also allowed for another innovation, an autoloader, which both increased the rate of fire and dispensed with the need for a loader. 
In turn, this allowed the whole turret to be smaller and lighter, which meant that the vehicle itself could also be smaller and lighter. The French even restricted the height of the crew to 1m70. That's just 5 foot 7 inches. Another clever point was that the gun was mounted relatively high, so that when the tank was in a hull down position, very little of the turret and nothing of the hull would be exposed to enemy fire, a very valuable thing in its ambush role. But there was also a disadvantage. Despite mounting the gun so high and keeping the overall turret height down, the gun could only be depressed to 6 degrees when 10 is the usual rule. This could be a real problem when the tank was positioned behind the crest of a slope. If the gradient was too steep, the gunner could not depress the gun far enough to fire directly down the slope on the other side, and the tank would have to move onto or over the crest to engage its target, exposing itself to return fire. The original gun itself was in fact a development of the 75mm L70 gun from the German Panther, but with a slightly shorter barrel. In the Panther, this had required a turret ring 1,650mm in diameter, but so clever were the AMX designs that it needed a turret ring of just 1,450mm, giving it the same amount of bang in a much smaller turret that could still traverse a full 360 degrees. The 75 gave it good anti-armour capability at the time, especially when firing hollow charge ammunition, and also allowed a reasonable HE shell to be fired important in its role as infantry support in the colonial wars in the French faced. This vehicle has the 75, but later the gun was upgraded to 90mm, with some variants getting a 105mm gun. This was because the original 75mm could not penetrate the frontal armour of the T-54 and the Centurion, two tanks it would come up against often when in service with Israel. Few tanks are as distinctive as the AMX. With its low profile hull, this weird looking turret set well back with its long overhang at the rear, what we tankies call the bustle, housing the autoloader mechanism. You could easily mistake it for a self propelled gun. Crew access was good since each of the three crew got his own hatch. The driver's hatch is front left, the commander's hatch is at the left rear of the turret, and next to that is the gunner's hatch. We can't see it, but there's also an escape hatch underneath the turret. Moving further back, there's a small flap in the back wall of the bustle, through which the autoloader ejected the empty shell cases. Other interesting things to note. Unlike most tanks of the time, the engine was at the front right, next to the driver. You can see the cooling fan on top and the service hatches. I'll be talking a bit more about the engine later. A spare wheel was carried above the engine, and you can see a spare track section next to it. Moving rearwards, there are grenade launchers on the lower part of the turret, and a standard French machine gun mounted coaxially with the main gun. OK, so that completes our overview of the AMX. But what's it like inside? How does the autoloader actually work? And what's it like to drive? Answers to all this and much more in part two.